Hi, today we're going to talk about spontaneous reactions and Gibbs free energy. We have just wrapped up talking about entropy and as we transition into this segment on the Gibbs free energy, we need to talk a bit about the second law of thermodynamics, which tells us that entropy is increasing in the universe. In other words, the universe is getting more and more disordered. A mathematical way of putting this is that the change in entropy of the universe is greater than zero. So some people interpret this to mean that a reaction cannot happen unless something is getting more disordered. But that is not true. So the question we have to ask ourselves is how can a system change to be more ordered? In other words, how can the delta S of that system be negative, less than zero? And so I want you to think about something in your life that becomes more orderly. Let's say that you have a messy kitchen and you want to get it clean because your mom is coming to visit. What would you have to do? Well, you can't just say kitchen, clean yourself and have everything become more neat and orderly, you actually have to go in the kitchen and do some work. And as you work, you might notice something. You might notice that you are actually burning energy. So at the end of cleaning the kitchen for an hour, you may find that you're more tired or that you're more hungry, which means that you need an energy input. Furthermore, you may feel warm. If you are really hustling, you might actually break a sweat. So as you work to decrease the entropy of your kitchen, you are putting energy into your environment. For example, one of the ways that you could do that is as you get warmer and warmer as you work, the air around you is going to absorb some of that heat and the air molecules are going to then move faster and then the average kinetic energy of the air molecules will increase which means that they will start moving around faster and rotating more and vibrating more so that increases the energy so the overall entropy of the universe may increase while a very small part of the universe becomes more orderly. So basically, a system can decrease in entropy if a certain amount of energy is put into it. So now we come to the idea of a spontaneous process. And a spontaneous process is a reaction that continues to occur without outside input. There are a couple of things that you need to know about spontaneous processes. First, Sometimes they need a little bit of an energy input to get them going. That doesn't stop them from being spontaneous. Second, just because they're spontaneous does not mean they will go on forever. So as an example, here's a ball perched on top of a hill and it is perfectly balanced right now, but if someone gives it a slight nudge, it could move down the hill. It would not roll downhill forever, only till it got to the bottom of the hill, but it does not need pushing to go down the hill. Once it starts going, it keeps going as long as there's hill left to roll down. By contrast, consider the reverse of this reaction where you're trying to roll a ball uphill. If you just give it a little nudge with your foot, it'll go up, but then it will roll back down again. So that is a non-spontaneous process. When it comes to processes, there's usually a spontaneous process and then the reverse process would be non-spontaneous. If you have a non-spontaneous process, the reverse process would be spontaneous. So how do we know if a reaction will be spontaneous? Basically, we look at two things. First of all, is there enough energy to make the reaction happen? A lot of times people think that exothermic processes have to be spontaneous, but that's not always the case. Sometimes there are exothermic reactions that are non-spontaneous. Sometimes there are endothermic reactions that are spontaneous. You do need to have enough energy present that you can get the activation energy going, but there are other considerations. Remember I said there were 
two things we had to think about. So the first is, what's the enthalpy of the reaction? The second thing is the entropy. Remember, the second law of thermodynamics tells us that the entropy of the universe should increase. How does this help the entropy of the universe increase? Does it? Sometimes there are things that happen spontaneously that end up decreasing the entropy of the system. But those things also have enough enthalpy or generally exothermic reactions that will overall help increase the entropy of the universe. So now we come to the Gibbs free energy, which helps us determine whether a reaction is spontaneous enough. And basically what it does is it looks at both the enthalpy and the entropy at a given temperature and pressure. So remember that for a lot of things, we're looking at deltas, we're looking at the change. And specifically in this case, we're looking at the change that occurs because a reaction is happening. So the change in the Gibbs free energy from the beginning of the reaction to the end of the reaction is going to be equal to the change in enthalpy of that reaction minus the temperature in Kelvin, it has to be in Kelvin, times the change in entropy. And this will help us evaluate whether or not a reaction is spontaneous. But you can see from looking at this that we are going to get a number out. If all we care about is, is something spontaneous? The answer to that should either be yes or no. And yet we're getting a number out, which implies that you might have something with more Gibbs free energy than others. So what does the Gibbs free energy actually mean? The physical meaning of that number that you get for delta G is that that is the maximum work that can be done by a system. So if you think about, for example, the system of a car engine burning gasoline, you can calculate how much energy will come out of that system but not all of that energy gets translated into the work of moving the car forward, right? Some of it is going to turn into heat and you could try and make the engine more efficient by let's say insulating it so that heat doesn't escape, but there will always be a maximum amount of work that can be done by a system and the rest of the energy is going to escape as heat. So the maximum work is the Gibbs free energy. So as I said, the Gibbs free energy values tell us whether a reaction is spontaneous enough. And basically what we're looking for is we're looking for negative delta G values. If delta G is less than zero for a particular reaction, that means the reaction is spontaneous. So then if delta G is greater than zero, that means the reaction is non-spontaneous. Now this covers a wide range of possibilities, but there is one thing that it excludes, and that is what happens if delta G equals zero. What that tells us is that the system is at equilibrium. Why is this the case? First of all, systems naturally move towards equilibrium. This is what we've been talking about for the past three chapters. So if a reaction moves the system towards equilibrium, that means that reaction will occur spontaneously, but any reaction that's going to move a system away from equilibrium will not occur spontaneously. So let's look at a couple of different reactions and discuss some concepts that have come up over the course of our study of equilibrium. So right at the very beginning of our study of equilibrium, I showed you this reaction and I asked whether you thought it was reversible or not. And I showed you the equilibrium constant being 9.1 times 10 to the 80th, we said, oh, our products are very heavily favored. That tells us that we're gonna have lots of products and very few reactants. So now let's think about this in terms of equilibrium. And remember, when we talk about equilibrium reactions, we always have that double-sided arrow. So let's think about it as a set of two reversible reactions. So if you have a bunch of hydrogen and oxygen, you're not going to be at equilibrium it wants to move towards the products, water. And so the reaction moving from hydrogen and oxygen gas to water 
is going to be spontaneous. But going from water to hydrogen and oxygen is not going to be spontaneous. And indeed, that is what we see when we sit there and stare at a bottle of water for hours on end. We will not see hydrogen and oxygen gas bubbling out. Here is another reaction, and you can see that the equilibrium constant for this is a lot smaller than the last reaction we looked at. So here our KC is 217 at this particular temperature, 500 Celsius. So let's say that we set up a system and when we calculate our reaction quotient for that system, it turns out to be 450. What does that tell us? Well, remember, if our Q value is greater than our K value, that means we have too many products, too few reactants. And so we are going to move from products to reactants. The products are going to combine to make more of the reactants. And that is what will happen spontaneously. What if we looked at our concentrations, calculated our reaction quotient, and our Q value ended up being 150? Now our Q value is smaller than Kc. That means we have too many reactants and too few products. And so what's going to happen is our reactants are going to combine to form products. And so now our forward reaction is going to be spontaneous and our reverse reaction is going to be non-spontaneous. So you can see that for this particular reaction, depending on what the concentrations of our products and reactants are, the forward reaction could be spontaneous or the reverse reaction could be spontaneous, but never both. So if our reaction quotient is less than our equilibrium constant, the system is going to move towards products, our forward reaction is spontaneous, and of course then our reverse reaction is not spontaneous. If our reaction quotient is greater than our equilibrium constant, the system is going to move towards reactants, our reverse reaction is spontaneous, and of course that means our forward reaction is non-spontaneous. So back to this chart, the reaction is spontaneous if delta G is less than zero. Delta G is greater than zero if reaction is non-spontaneous, but what that means is the reverse reaction is the one that's spontaneous. And then if delta G equals zero, the system is at equilibrium, and what that means is you don't have either the forward or the reverse reaction favored. So let's look at the equation for the Gibbs free energy again delta G equals delta H minus T delta S, and let's think about some possibilities. The first is we have delta H less than zero, that means we have an exothermic reaction, and our delta S is greater than zero, so that is increasing the entropy of the system. So if delta H is negative, our temperature is always going to be positive, because it's in Kelvin, and delta S is also positive, so if temperature and delta S are both positive, and we're subtracting something that's positive. So we have a negative thing plus a negative thing, and that's gonna give us a negative answer. So in this case, delta G has to be negative. Let me explain what that means in plain English. If you have an exothermic reaction that also increases entropy, that will always be spontaneous. Okay, let's take a different set of conditions. Here we have delta H, less than zero, so again an exothermic reaction, but this time we have delta S being less than zero, so it is decreasing in entropy. What does that mean? So our delta H is negative again, our temperature is always positive, but here delta S is negative, so you have a positive thing times a negative thing, a negative thing, negative of a negative quantity will give you a positive thing. So you have your negative term of delta H, plus something, is that going to be greater than or less than zero? Well, that depends on how big your temperature is. So if you have a really small temperature, you're going to be adding a very tiny amount to your delta H. If you have a really large temperature, you're going to be adding a large amount to your delta H. So this reaction is only spontaneous when the temperature is small. 
And this is for when you have an exothermic reaction that decreases entropy, then that reaction is only spontaneous at low temperatures. So now we're going to look at a different set of conditions in which we have an endothermic reaction. So our delta H is greater than zero. This time we have our entropy greater than zero. So our entropy is increasing and we have an endothermic reaction. We have a positive value for delta H. Our temperature is always positive, but if our temperature is positive and our delta S is positive, so then we have T delta S will be positive, but then subtracting T delta S, that means we're gonna be subtracting from our positive delta H value. Are we gonna be subtracting enough to give us a negative number for delta G? Again, this is going to depend 100% on how big our temperature is. If we have a really big temperature, then we're subtracting a really large number from delta H, and that will give us a negative delta G. If we have a really tiny number, that gives us a very small number to subtract from our delta H value, and then we'll have a positive delta G. So when you have a reaction that's endothermic and increases entropy, that reaction will only be spontaneous at high temperatures, large values for T. Okay, final condition. So here we have an endothermic reaction that's decreasing the entropy. So we have a positive value for delta H, our always positive temperature, and then our delta S is negative. So we have a positive times a negative thing, which gives us a negative value, but we're subtracting that negative value, which means we're adding a positive value to our positive delta H, which means we can't have a negative answer. Delta G has to be greater than zero. And so for endothermic reactions that decrease the entropy, your reaction is never spontaneous. So here's a little summary chart. One of the ways you can think about this is from a purely enthalpic point of view, just looking at enthalpy, a system will always prefer exothermic reactions. If you're only thinking about entropy, a system will always prefer something that increases entropy. But when you have those two things working against each other, if you have something that's favorable from an enthalpy point of view, but unfavorable from an entropy point of view, or if you have something that's unfavorable from an enthalpy point of view, but favorable from an entropy point of view, then those things are gonna be temperature dependent. Basically, Gibbs free energy is a way of putting together both our entropy and our enthalpy considerations to see whether we're gonna end up with a spontaneous reaction. I hope this was helpful and I will see you again soon.